Hi, I would like to invite you in a world that is so small, so minute that it will help you realize the grandiosity of this life you are living in. My name is Jonas and I would like to welcome you to the world of microbiology. Microbiology, in a strict sense, is an advanced course of biology. You all know, based from your previous learnings, that biology basically originated from two words. Bio, which means life, and logos, which means the study. Basically, biology can literally be translated as the study of life. Microbiology being a specialized area of biology specifically deals with tiny life forms that are not readily observed or seen without magnification, which is to say that they are microscopic. The concept of these minute life forms were probably even presented by your mothers as germs. Scientifically speaking, these microscopic organisms or microorganisms are also called microbes. Therefore, microbiology is the study of microbes. Unlike biology, which is literally translated as the study of life, microbiology, in a strict sense, does not only focuses on things that have life, but also tackles those that are considered to be non-living. To further understand this, there are two general classifications of microbes. Number one will be acellular microbes, and number two will be cellular microbes. I would like to say that if this life is a game of survivors or probably last man standing, or should I rather say last organism standing, the ultimate survi survivors will be microbes. The oldest fossil dated in history points to a bacteria-like cell that have existed probably 3.5 billion years ago, suggesting that bacteria have dominated the life here on Earth for approximately 2 billion years long. It is apparent that these ancient cells were simple, lacking specialized internal structures to carry out their functions. The genetic materials of these cells are all over the place and without any no known bound to separate these compartments called the nucleus or carrion. Therefore, these microorganisms as were termed as prokaryotic or literally translated as before the nucleus. Fossils that were dated approximately 1.8 billion years old, however, revealed that these prokaryotes started to develop. They started to mutate and became more complex, developing nucleus and various specialized internal structure now we know as organelles. These organisms are now termed as eukaryotes with respect to the existence of a true nucleus. Together with prokaryotes and eukaryotes, both of these are considered to be cellular microorganisms. Generally speaking, prokaryotes are smaller than the eukaryotes because they lack this dedicated nucleus and organelles. However, basic functions of both of these are somewhat similar. Prokaryotes includes bacteria and archaea. Due to the complexity of eukaryotes, on the other hand, only some of them are considered to be microorganisms, which includes the primary algae, protozoa, 
your molds, and your yeast, which are basically fungi, and certain animals, such as worms and anthropods. The last two groups mentioned are not entirely microscopic by nature. However, these worms and anthropods that causes diseases usually requires the use of microscopes in order for us to adequately identify them. Ergo, the inclusion of these microorganisms in our subject. Just a disclaimer, your previous definition of microorganisms that these are things that cannot be literally viewed by your naked eyes is not technically correct because the largest microorganisms has a length of approximately 4 millimeters in size which is basically already visible to your eyes as well as my eyes. In order to continue our discussion in these microbes, I would like to rewind a little bit of time, probably a couple of months ago, where uh, the world has been hit by a disease condition named coronavirus disease 2019, or as we know it, COVID-19. This condition undeniably shut down the world and is still currently causing numerous deaths all over the world. The origin of this disease is yet to be determined. Some say that it originated from a province in China. Others will claim that it originated from animals such as bats or even pangolins, existing to those very rare scales. Despite the origin of this disease yet to be determined, one thing is for sure, that the causative agent of this condition is SARS-CoV-2, a virus which is highly uh, uh, a resemblance of coronavirus which caused SARS which also resulted to multiple deaths a couple of years ago. Virus are now considered to be another type of microbes, different from that of your cellular microorganisms. They are microscopic by nature and can cause infection or diseases, but technically they are not cells. We can say that they lie in an area between large molecules and a cell. They are much simpler than cells. It's like a gift. Inside a protein-based wrapper is a DNA code, a hereditary material. Some biologists will refer to virus as parasitic organisms. Others will say that they even existed before bacteria did. However, regardless of their origin, their impact to the world of medicine as well as health is an undeniable fact. Now, the question is, why do we need to study microbiology? Although microbes are very small by dimensions, it is undeniable that these microbes play significant roles in our lives. This part of the lecture will help you have a picture of this importance and roles they play in the world both you and I live in. Microbes are said to be ubiquitous, meaning to say they are virtually everywhere. They are in fact involved in what you call the balance. Maintaining the balance in this world, maintaining that flow of energy and food all throughout our ecosystem. I'm talking about, number one, photosynthesis. When we talk about photosynthesis, we always think about plants, especially those deep green in color and the manner they manufacture their own food source through the use of light. This is defined as a light-fueled conversion of that carbon dioxide particles to organic material, which will serve as the basis of food of these plants and producing 
That oxygen, which plays a vital component, important for your everyday physiologic functions. However, do you know that approximately half of the, of the total accounts of photosynthesis happening all throughout the world is from algae? Which is to say that majority of the oxygen supply as well as photosynthesis happening all throughout the world is from these microorganisms. Photosynthesis has been established as a process of creation. In order to maintain balance, there should also be this counterpart we call destruction in the process we call decomposition. Decomposition is another process that keeps the earth in balance. This process involves the breakdown of dead matter and wastes into simple compounds that can be directed back or recycled to natural cycles of living things. This process is basically aided by this what you call saprophytes. Aside from maintaining balance, microbes also play an important function in maintaining our different physiologic processes, such as your digestion. Every single time you think about taking in or eating in some gyupsal, that pork belly wrapped in lettuce with an added luscious goodness of red bean paste, or even when you just think about drinking milk tea or any food or drink for that matter. Taking in food will not make it available readily for your physiologic consumption. However, there are microbes living within your gut that helps you convert this food and drinks that you are taking in for them to be available for your physiologic consumption. For example, let's talk about cellulose. Cellulose are present in plants or any vegetations or vegetables for that matter that you take in. Cows and rabbits are some of the animals that contains microorganisms that enables them to digest cellulose. However, for us humans, when we eat corn, we defecate corn kernels because we don't have these identical microorganisms that enables these animals to digest cellulose. Another important thing is that these microbes help us synthesize vitamin B complex or B12 for that matter, as well as vitamin K, which is important for the synthesis of your red blood cells as well as your platelets. Second, in the field of medicine, we also utilize some bacteria and fungi to treat patients with infectious diseases. Well, in fact, as of the moment, multiple researches and researchers have been developing vaccine for COVID-19. This is a perfect example of biotechnology, wherein both antibiotics and antiviral drugs are being developed to basically function hindering the growth of these respective microbes. Going back to my previous example, as you eat some gyupsal, of course it is perfectly coupled with a glass of that fermented drink or rice wine, or as the Koreans, our Korean friends, uh, label them, soju. Together with this processed foods, condiments, even the bread you had this breakfast, or that coffee you drank it with, all of these are products of different microbial processes involved in the food industry, which is also a product of biotechnology. 
Fourth will be the recent advancements such as gene splicing that now allows us to design what we call recombinant microbes or recombinant DNA wherein new genes are being inserted into bacteria and other microbes to produce substances such as hormones, insulin, clotting factors, vaccine, hemoglobin, erythropoietin, and other antibiotic or antibodies. Another important use of your microbes is in the field of the disease process. When we casually talk about microbes, we usually pertain to these microorganisms that cause diseases. Well, in fact, I would like you to understand that only 1-3% to of all the microbes in the world that we live in are considered to be disease-causing or what we call or term as pathogens. This makes the vast majority of the microbes non-pathogenic. Well, in fact, in your body, in our body, there are 10 times more microbes than our actual total cell counts. Collectively, these uh, microbes are known as indigenous microflora. And most of the part, they actually play a benefit in our physiologic processes. These microbes under ordinary uh, circumstances does not cause any diseases. However, given an opportunity to uh, invade a particular anatomical area cavity that they are not supposed to be in, they might result to different disease processes. These are what you call opportunistic pathogens. Basically, an indigenous microflora who had an opportunity to colonize a particular area of the body resulting to a disease condition. In order to, uh, to understand the disease processes, you need to understand two major concepts. Number one is the infectious disease wherein a pathogen will colonize a person's body and this pathogen will result to manifestation of different diseases. That is what you call infection or infectious diseases. Number two will be microbial intoxication. When we say intoxication, a pathogen will produce toxin outside of the host. The person now, as the host, will ingest these produced toxins and on a latter portion or after some period of time, this will result to diseases. This process is what you call microbial intoxication. Now we know the basic definition of microbiology as well as the functions and roles these microorganisms or microbes play in our life. The question that we are about to tackle now is, how did microbiology start? It all started in an observation done by Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke is an Englishman with extensive contribution in the field of astronomy, biology, as well as physics. One of his most important works of science happened in the year 1665, where he published his work entitled Micrographia. In this work of his, he basically observed corks and concluded that the life's smallest structural units were little boxes. 
this groundbreaking work of his coined the term cell. He added that all things are made up of cells. In order to study microbes, we need instrument that will help us see them. Enters the time when a man resting from his day job created microscope. I'm talking about Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. Van Leeuwenhoek is a Dutch merchant. One who sells linens and different merchandise for draperies as well as upholstery. During his break time from a long day of work, he usually goes to a workbench at the back of his shop, grinding lenses to ever finer specifications. At first, he used these ground lenses to visualize, to visualize cloths as well as linens to finer details. Eventually, he became so interested in things that he's not satisfied in viewing threads anymore and started to examine almost anything that he lays his hands upon, including scrapings from his teeth, water from ditches, blood, sperm samples, and even specimens from his own diarrheal stools. Among these specimens, he observed tiny living creatures, which he called animalcules. This gave him the title of the father of microbiology, bacteriology, as well as protozoology. Both the works of Van Leeuwenhoek as well as Robert Hooke convinced many scientists of their time about the existence of microbes and started to speculate the exact origin of these microbes. Many scientists during this time believe that life can be generated spontaneously from inanimate object. This ideology gave birth to the concept of a biogenesis or the theory of spontaneous generation where life can arise spontaneously from non-living material. For almost two years, this concept has been a topic for debate. And following several works, the theory of biogenesis started to appear, disproving and countering the previous theory of a biogenesis. In the year 1668, an Italian physicist, naturalist, and biologist in the person of Francisco Redi first challenged the theory of spontaneous generations. Among his famous work is Esperienze in Torno alla Generación del Gui Insetti, or in English, Experiments on the Generation of Insects. His experiments concerns basically about meats and maggots, where he used a total of three jars with one piece of veal per jar. He left one of the sample completely exposed, the others covered with cork and gauze respectively. After several days, flies could only enter the uncovered jar. And this very sample of his were observed to have growths of maggots. In the jar that was covered with gauze, maggots appeared on the gauze, but did not survive. On the third sample, which was sealed by a cork, no maggots growth were observed. Based from these observations of his, he is very careful in expressing his findings 
due to religious influences at that time. He used his famous adage, Omne vivum ex vivo. Or in English, all life comes from life. This gave him the title of father of parasitology and the founder of experimental biology. Now as time goes by, people became more interested in microbiology and studying microorganisms, one of whom is John Needham, an English biologist who challenged the claim of biogenesis and still insisted that life can sprout from dead. The experiments consisted of briefly boiling a broth mixture and then cooling that mixture in an open container exposed in room temperature. Later, it was found out that microbes would eventually grow after several days. Those experiments seem to show that life indeed can sprout or be produced spontaneously or from inanimate objects. However, a particular scientist in the person of Lazaro Spallanzani contradicted the findings and challenged the findings of the work of John Needham and stated that Mr. Needham forgot a particular variable considered in his experiment. In the year 1765, 20 years after the experiment conducted by John Needham, Lazaro Spallanzani produced his first systemic rebuttal of the theory of spontaneous generation, which was proposed by Needham and his colleagues. While Needham stated that life can sprout from inorganic matter given sufficient amount of time, Spallanzani insisted that this is not an inherent characteristic of matter and that it can be destroyed. To conduct his research, he basically prepared two samples of broths and boiled them in a prolonged time unlike that of Needham. One sample was kept exposed to air and the other sample was sealed using cork. After some time, the sample open to the environment developed microbes while the sealed sample remained free from any bacterial or microbial growth. As microbes did not reappear as long as the material was tightly sealed, he proposed that microbes move through air and that it can be killed through boiling. This work of Lazaro Palanzani paved the way to the work of Louis Pasteur. Generalizing from all the works that was previously discussed, finally, in the year 1858, in the person of Mr. Rudolf Virchow, the theory of biogenesis was finally proposed, where he stated and claimed that life can only arise from pre-existing life. Following this theory by Virchow, multiple researches were conducted. One of the most successful experiments that delivered a fatal blow to what was previously believed to be the truth is Louis Pasteur's experiment. You might probably be familiar with the name of Louis Pasteur, or Pasteur for that matter, for it can be commonly found in current labels of milk products or even wine that you usually consume. This is true because he invented the process of pasteurization, where the goal was to kill pathogens in many types of liquids. 
This procedure was carried out through centuries and is not only used in food industry but also in the field of medicine. This has contributed a lot to what we call now as the antisepsis or aseptic technique which will be introduced later on by Joseph Lister. Pasteur's experiment is simple yet brilliant. He used the same method to sterilize the broth mixture that Needham and Spallanzani utilized. However, he used a specialized flask with elongated swan neck. The openings of this flask were kept open to air, but the curved tube serves or serve as traps to this airborne particles, preventing their entry to the main flask. The flask that remained intact did not have any microbial growths. However, the flask that broke and was open to the environment was found out to have microbial growth themselves. Basing from these findings, he stated that there is no circumstance in which it can be confirmed that microorganisms or microscopic beings came out into the world without germs, without parents similar to themselves. Among the contributions of Louis Pasteur were the introduction of the terms aerobes, or organisms that requires oxygen to live, and anaerobes, those that do not require oxygen. Where he found that yeast is responsible for converting sugar into alcohol in the presence of or in the absence of air. Pasteurization was then developed, a process that heats liquid at approximately 56 degrees Celsius to kill most bacteria responsible for spoilage. He also identified three different microbes for silkworm disease. Also, among the significant contributions of Pasteur was his contribution to the germ theory, which states that specific microbes cause specific infectious diseases, the very theory that our mother supports. Also, he helped determine or de and develop uh, vaccines to prevent chicken cholera, anthrax, and different skin diseases, which made him really famous in France during that time because these three problems that were aforementioned caused a significant downfall on the country's economy. Well, speaking of vaccine, another significant development in the field of medicine spearheaded by Louis Pasteur was the development of the rabies vaccine. Anti-rabies shot that was injected to your pet dogs and cat or even the anti-rabies shot that was used to treat human rabies. During his lifetime, he was never given credit nor awards from his works since originally Louis Pasteur was a linen merchant and not a scientist nor a physician. Not until the year 1888 when the Pasteur Institute was created in Paris where he directed up until his death in the year 1895. Following his works are two significant men namely John Tyndall and Ferdinand Cohn. John Tyndall provided initial evidence that some of the microbes in dust and air ha are very or requires high heat in order for them to be destroyed and suggested that rigorous treatment is needed for them to be eradicated. Later, this statement was further strengthened by the work of Ferdinand Kohn, a German botanist who discovered and detailed the description of heat-resistant bacterial endospores, the very main reason why heat 
at times fails to kill and completely eliminate microorganisms. All of this work contributed largely to the development of what we know now as the germ theory of diseases that states that specific microbes cause specific diseases. Again, the very theory that our mothers believe in. Before, people believed that diseases were caused by divine punishment, poisonous vapors, curses, witchcrafts, and many more. However, as the development in the field of microbiology continued, this has been changed. As the study of microbiology became more and more scientific and the invisible becomes more visible, the fear of vapors, curses, witchcrafts were replaced by the knowledge, or should I say, fear of germs. More than a century ago, the first researches by Robert Koch as well as Louis Pasteur clearly linked microorganisms responsible to specific diseases. Even up until now, scientists never cease to search for the culprit of these diseases causing agents. That's why you now know that COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2. During this period, it came to realization among individualists that even the environment and the body itself can be a source of infection. I now welcome you to the time frame of the golden age of microbiology. Dr. Oliver Holmes, an American physician, first observed that infection among patients who delivered in the hospital is significantly higher compared to patients who delivered through home birth. His observations showed that there is a significant relationship or a variable that might have caused its findings. Another doctor from Hungary, in the person of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, made his observations that shows women became more infected in the maternity ward after physicians perform physical examination while being directly from the autopsy room. This gave them the idea of the importance of hand hygiene. Thus, he was now coined as the father of hand hygiene. Very timely in this pandemic that we're currently living in. Another physician, or should I say surgeon, became famous at this golden age of microbiology. I'm talking about Joseph Lister. This English surgeon took into his work the observations done by both Dr. Holmes and Dr. Semmelweis. He first introduced the, ser the term aseptic techniques or the principle of asepsis which aims to basically reduce the microbes present in the medical setting thus preventing any wound infection his concept of asepsis seemed to be simpler compared to what we have now for it only focused on hand hygiene as well as spraying a strong antiseptic chemical where he used carbolic acid, spraying them to different areas and surfaces, and even the air, which resulted to a significant decrease in the number of infection and deaths related to surgery. Well, during this time, surgeons even performed surgeries while wearing street clothes. I would like to say that the concept of asepsis, despite being simple during that time, has laid the important groundwork of how we perform surgical preparation and maintaining sterility during and after surgery, which you will learn more in the future comes the time you will be tackling about perioperative nursing.
Well, speaking of nursing, there is no better example than our very own Florence Nightingale and her environmental theory, where she highlighted that environmental conditions are important and needed to improve patient's condition. She basically introduced the concept of cleanliness and sterility or asepsis in the field of nursing. Together with the previous scientists, another major proponent who contributed significantly to the germ theory is the German physician Robert Koch. Among his contributions were developing methods of fixing, straining, and photographing bacteria. He also developed methods in cultivating bacteria on solid medium, developing a pure culture. When we talk about pure culture, it is the growth of one single microorganism in an outside environment, or as we term it, in vitro. Together with his colleague, R.J. Petri, Koch was able to produce cool mo pure cultures of microbes in a flat glass dish. You now know as the Petri dish from the name of his colleague, of course. He also discovered the causative agent of tuberculosis, cholera, and anthrax. Koch also worked on tuberculin, a protein derivative from the causative agent of tuberculosis, which is being used up till present in performing skin testing, valuable in determining tuberculosis up to date. All of these contributions made by Robert Koch was accomplished using a series of scientific steps that he and his colleagues developed which was now known as Koch's postulate. The provisions of the Koch's postulate are as follows. Number one, a particular microbe should be found in all cases of diseases and must not be found or present among healthy animals or human beings. Number two, the microbes must be isolated from a diseased, micro or diseased animal or human and grown in a pure culture in the laboratory. Number three, that same diseases must be produced when these cultured microbes from pure culture are to be inoculated into healthy susceptible laboratory animals. And lastly, number four, the same microbe must also be recovered from the, ex the experimentally infected animals and grown again in pure culture. The other significant contributors in the field of microbiology during the Golden Age are the works of Hans Christian Gram, which is basically the proponent of the Gram's training techniques, which distinguished bacteria into two major classifications, Gram-positive as well as Gram-negative, which also made it more appreciated under the, vi under the use of microscope. Another person, Edward Jenner. Probably not related to Kylie or any of the Kardashians, Edward Jenner is considered the father of immunology with his work that stopped a global occurrence of smallpox. At the year 1980, after facilitation of global immunization, which was led by WHO, the world finally declared complete eradication of smallpox. With this hope, may there be another Edward Jenner in our time to discover the vaccine for this current pandemic that we are currently experiencing. Now we proceed to the period of the modern microbiology, which started in the year 1914. 
after the presentation of the germ theory, it has been established that there is indeed a significant connection between microbes and different diseases. The focus of microbiology has now shifted to determining substances that could kill these pathogenic microorganisms. The first concept of magic bullet was introduced, which was basically a chemical that can totally eradicate pathogens without damaging surrounding tissues. Also in this period, the term chemotherapy was coined. Chemotherapy is now defined as any treatment of a particular disease by any chemicals. Something that is nice to know, quinine was the first known chemical to treat a disease which was used by Spanish conquistadors. When we talk about chemotherapy, there are two major key terms that you need to understand. Number one is the term synthetic drugs. These are chemicals that are artificially prepared in laboratory. The second term is your antibiotics, which are chemicals naturally produced by bacteria and fungi to act against other microorganisms. Both of these factors are important in order for you to understand chemotherapy, and other concepts of pharmaceutics. During this period, uh, the following persons have their work highly noticed. Number one would be Paul Elric. His laboratory discovered Salvarsan, the first medicinal treatment for syphilis. Also, Mr. Elric popularized the use of the term magic bullet. Another person is Sir Alexander Fleming, a Scottish biologist slash physician slash microbiologist slash pharmacologist who is most famous for his discovery of the enzyme lysosome in the year 1923 and the world's first broadly effective antibiotic substance in the form of benzyl penicillin or what we know now as PENG. Due to his research, he was knighted in the year 1944 and was named in the Time Magazine's list of 100 most important people in the 20th century. Since the start of the era of modern microbiology, thousands of antibiotics have been developed. However, there are two notable challenges that microbiologists during this period faced and up till present is currently facing. Number one will be a lot of these discovered materials are toxic to humans for practical use despite the fact that they hinder the growth or totally eradicate the target organism. They cause significant physiologic damage, enough for them to injure human beings. And number two, as different chemotherapeutic chemicals or drugs are being developed, microorganisms start to adapt, developing new strains of microorganisms which are now resistant to previously effective antibiotics. This current scenario that we are living in is a product of which SARS-CoV-2, as previously mentioned, is another mutation of SARS-CoV. Currently, medications that were used to combat SARS is not effective to our current adversary. Same is true with taking antibiotics. This is the very main reason why doctors or physicians prescribe a definite amount of antibiotics to be taken in a definite period of time. Alterations of these prescriptions might lead to a development of a stronger microorganism, 
now resistant to a previous effective treatment. Patients need to adhere to this prescription in order to completely eradicate these microorganisms. Now that we have an idea of a brief, a brief background of how microbiology has evolved, we now arrive to the question, where are we currently in the field of microbiology? Based from our previous discussion, we can conclude two things. Number one, it has been clear that microorganisms have a monumental importance to the Earth's operation. The impact of these microbes in our lives are truly undeniable. And number two, that microbiology has come a long way. Whether consciously or not, we have been utilizing the principle of microbiology in our daily lives. From the time you wake up and eat that fluffy pandesal dipped in a hot cup of coffee, to the time that you sit down and start to unwind with your friends with a glass of wine or even a bottle of beer. These human manipulations of microorganisms to make several products in the industrial or everyday setting is what you call biotechnology. Genetic engineering is another discipline wherein the newer era utilized the advantage of biotechnology where they have manipulated genetic codes of microbes, plants, animals, and even human beings to create new products that are genetically modified organisms. One powerful technique being utilized in designing new organisms is termed as recombinant DNA. Recombinant DNA is a technology that allows deliberate alteration of DNA, switching genetic material from one organism to the other. This is very useful, especially in the field of pharmaceutics, where alterations in genetic codes of both bacteria and fungi produce drugs, hormones, or even enzymes that are potential solution to different physiologic conditions. Multiple disciplines branch out from microbiology. Well, at this period, in order for me to determine your attendance for this uh, online tutorial, I would like you to fill in the blanks of this slide that you can find in this video. You are to submit your work through Canvas. Now, to wrap up my presentation, we have talked about several terms. Number one is microbiology, which we define as the study of microorganisms and microbes, where we further classified microbes into acellular and cellular microbes. Acellular microbes being your viruses and virons, and your cellular microbes, which was furtherly subdivided into two classifications. You have your prokaryotic cells, which does not contain a true nucleus, and a eukaryotic cell, which was based from the existence of a true, well-defined nucleus accompanied by organelles. Also, we have defined several uses and importance of microbiology in our everyday life. We have mentioned balance, talked about photosynthesis, and decomposition. We have also presented different physiologic functions that are being aided by these different microbes. Also, we have highlighted their developments in the field of medicine, food and beverage, as well as genetic engineering. Also, we have discussed the importance of understanding the principles of microbiology and on how diseases happen. 
we further specified two concepts in order to determine and explain these disease processes. Number one is the concept of infectious disease and microbial intoxication. We have also discussed the historical background of how microbiology came about. We started during the time of the first observation from Robert Hooke and his discovery of cells, Anton van Leeuwenhoek and his microscope, as well as the development of the theory of abiogenesis, which stated that life can develop spontaneously from inanimate objects. However, microbiology continued to evolve, and at the year or the 19th century, where Rudolf Virchow finally pre uh, presented his theory in biogenesis. We have also uh, looked on the findings of Francisco Redis' experiment with meats and maggots. You also have the boiling experiments of uh, John Needham as well as Lazarus Palanzani, which determined that several microorganisms can be killed using heat through boiling. Strengthening the findings of these researches comes the life of Louis Pasteur, who presented the theory of pasteurization. Together with all these findings contributed to the theory we now know as germ theory of diseases, which marked the arrival of the golden age of microbiology. We have also tackled the lives and works of Dr. Oliver Holmes as well as Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. Also presented the life of Joseph Lister. By the way, I forgot to mention, Joseph Lister was the exact person or the exact pattern where the, the product Listerin originated, an antiseptic oral wash. Also, we have tackled a little bit about the works of Florence Nightingale and her environmental theory and how she introduced the concept of asepsis in the science and practice of nursing. We have also discussed Koch's postulate, the four provisions of Koch's postulate, as well as pretend, uh, presented the works of Hans Christian Gram and his Gram's training techniques, as well as the father of immunology, with which, uh, who is uh, Edward Jenner. Arriving at the modern period of, mic of microbiology, we have discussed chemotherapy and two concepts associated to which, namely synthetic drugs and antibiotic drugs. During this time, we have also discussed the work of uh, Paul Elric, as well as the work of Alexander Fleming and his Penji. We have also talked about several problems that were encountered by microbiologists during that period up until present. Number one will be that there are a lot of antibiotics that were developed during that time. However, it was found out that it causes excessive damage for human consumption. And number two, that multiple microorganisms has started to mutate, now being tolerant to previously effective antibiotics. Also, don't forget to accomplish your assignment posted in your canvas, which aim to describe the different divisions of microbiology, namely bacteriology, mycology, parasitology, immunology, virology, protozoology, as well as phycology. Before we end, I would like you to understand that the very purpose why you are currently viewing this video is for us to improve our base knowledge. And don't forget that learning is always a fun experience. With that, I hope you stay safe. God bless.